Okay. Um, yes, so hello everyone. We might as well get started now, I suppose. We're at about 20 people. Um, welcome, first of all, everyone to another uh, ISP Singapore Technical Tuesday session. Uh, as you can all see from your screens, this is uh, a talk by Chu Wei on quality by design and PAT process analytical technology. Um, I assume the talk will go on for about 45 minutes, uh, Chu Wei, would that be fair to say? Um, or yep, yep, around that time. Yeah, perfect. Or shorter even. Yeah, uh, whatever time it finishes after that, then we'll have a little questions and answers session. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll moderate that as well. If any of you have any questions, uh, you can save it for the end. Okay, so without further ado, Chewy, please take it away. Okay, a very good evening, everyone. Um, thanks to ISP Singapore for this invite to share some of the uh, thinking that I have with respect to uh, PAT and QVD. Um, in particular, I kind of um, put this as challenges and opportunities. So let me kind of give you the uh, overview of what we're gonna go through. So I'm gonna kind of revisit what is PAT and QVD. I think quite a number of you are quite familiar with this, but let us just go through very quickly. And let's look at some of the ongoing challenges and what are the opportunities that are rising at this point in time. And uh, I'll, I'll round it off with a summary of what I've kind of uh, put together tonight. Um, if, yeah, some of you may, may have your microphones on, maybe you can just mute it for the time being, right? Okay, and if you're interested, I can share a bit more about some of the r and I'm doing at uh, CIFB. CIFB is the uh, latest um, research institute in uh, ASTAR. It's called the Singapore Institute for Food and Biotechnology Innovation. So uh, if you you like, and we have a bit of time, I can share a bit more on what I'm doing there. Okay, first thing first, let's revisit PAT and QBD. Right, so what's PAT QBD? Again, I'm taking from the FDA um, 20, 2004 framework for innovative pharmaceutical development guidance. Um, what you do see here is the uh, statement saying that the goal of PAT is to enhance understanding and control of manufacturing process, which is consistent with FDA's current drug quality system, which is quality cannot be tested into products, it should be built in or should be by design, so aka QBD. And consequently, the tools and principles described in that 2004 guidance should be used for gaining process understanding and can also be used to meet the regulatory requirements for validating and controlling the manufacturing process. So some of you know this pretty well. This is just a start starter. So why QBD and PAT? Essentially, um, I think many of you are actually in the plant. I actually have not worked in a pharmaceutical company. Uh, to a large extent, I'm coming from the academic background working in ASTAR for the past 16 over years. But um, if you just refer to this uh, chapter in, uh, on quality by design, um, you see that uh, some of you are involved in some of these things in API manufacturing. You start off with say, for example, the hydrogenation and it follows on with filtration, pH adjustments, yet another filtration, drying, isolation of intermediates, crystallization, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm not gonna go into all the details. You know it better than I do. And to a large extent, there are different kinds of key parameters. It may be your reactants. It may be your pH temperature, your addition rate. And what you're trying to get out from there is key attributes like your particle size and your impurity profile. So having said all these, and, and those of you who actually work on the manufacturing floor, you do realize that each step has its own particularities, each step can fail at many points. And as a result of which, um, if there's a means of tracking what's going on in terms of all these complex different steps, that will be something that will be very useful. So if you move on to the secondary part of manufacturing, you've got things like pre-blend, the milling, the blend again, and et cetera, et cetera, compress and whatever else. You've got different sets of uh, key material attributes. Um, this will then come from the primary side of things, maybe particle size or impurity profile. 
and you have other sets of uh, operation parameters like your roll force, your, your mill size, screen size, granulator speed, etc. And some of the key attributes here will be your stratified tablet content uniformity, your DP impurity profile, and, and many of these will influence your bioavailability when the patient eats the drug. So that's very much on the small molecule side. If you then look into biopharma, it's yet another set of uh, complexities. So what you see again is things like your fermenter, harvesting, lysis, maybe mechanical, chemical, or even heat treatment. Look at the primary recovery and the clarification. And you can use all sorts of chromatography, maybe ion exchange, size exclusion, gel, whatsoever. And finally, polishing your final API and get to your formulation stage. So what I'm trying to say here is that irrespective of what you're seeing here, it might be in small molecules, it might be in biopharma, you have all kinds of different complex situations. When I say complex here, I'm a chemical engineer by training. So anything that's dealing with more than one phase, phase here meaning gas, liquid, or solid, or worse still, your solid liquid and all kinds of funny situations, especially when you talk about fermenter. I'll talk a bit more on fermentation later on. Um, it's very difficult. It's very hard for you to actually follow the whole process. So as a result of which, um, when people look at quality by design, they often look at a few different aspects. It can be from a pharmaceutical development aspect. It can be from a manufacturing process. It can be in process control, product specification, control strategy, or even life cycle management. So the current state essentially, even though PAT has been kind of um, spoken about and talked about, published, and, and there are some success stories, but to a large extent, what you do see in the pharmaceutical manufacturing is an empirical situation, where when you do development here is typically by univariate experiments. You can actually have a lot of lockdown situation validation on three batches focused on reproducibility. And in process testing, that's totally against the whole QBD principle, right? And it's go or no go offline analysis. And of course the product specifications means that it's, it's very much to do with your quality control and it's based on your batch data. And in terms of control here, you can only look at your intermediate and end product testing to pass your test and there are situations where some of the APIs are just kind of locked down in warehouses just because um, it has yet to be tested, right? And as a result of all these, uh, many of the uh, life cycle management is pretty reactive to problems. So there's a lot of post-approval changes that's needed. However, if you're looking at the desired QBD state that's being um, kind of uh, promoted, you start to see a more systematic and multivariate experimentation going on in terms of the upstream R&D. And there can be an adjustment of design space because based on quality by design, if you look at ICHQ8, you can actually move around your design space. And that is not a violation of your um, set operation parameters, right? So that can give you more control in terms of the focus that you can look at the control strategy more than just looking at lockdown specs. And of course, with PAT, you can then potentially utilize feedback and feed forward in real time. And um, this then a part of the whole quality control strategy and it's risk-based that's kind of linked back to ICHQ9. And essentially Q9, Q10, Q8, and even like Q7, all these documents kind of work together hand in hand. And ultimately, when you try to apply this to your um, product lifecycle, this will be a continual improvement that is enabled within, again, your design space, right? So this is what people are trying to achieve by moving from the current state to the desired QBD state. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I don't have that kind of space tonight, but if you're interested, just uh, contact me somehow and, and um, we can have a bit of more discussion. I can definitely forward to you this critical review I've written 10 years ago, even though it's kind of dated, but um, as you all know, the uh, regulatory environment that we're in for our pharmaceutical industries kind of make things a bit slow in terms of moving, right? So it's to a large extent still applicable. So having kind of like touched base and revisited what's PAT and QBD, let's, let's kind of talk about the ongoing challenges. 
And uh, okay, this, this data has been dated partly because I'm not in the industry, I don't have the latest situation. But as most of you hate to see, there are human drug recalls, right? And once you have recalls, there's, there's all kinds of issues coming in, not just with respect to you need to dig out your documentation and start explaining to folks from the regulatory, but there's um, economic consequences and, and worse still, if let's say someone got hurt or someone get killed by accidentally ingesting the wrong drug, that, that is quite a bad situation. So that is about the recall part of things. But when you start to look at the reasons behind the recall, oftentimes it has to do with CGMP deficiencies, right, when the inspectors comes in. And it can be um, all sorts of issues. It can be laboratory controls are not there or inadequate. It might even be that your equipment is not properly maintained, right, your PQOQs and whatever else is not actually done correctly. And uh, sad to say there are also the lack or inadequate SOPs around. Um, there's also process validation protocol issues. There's issues with the production and process control. And even the analytical method can, can be um, not so much validated from time to time. So some of these things, of course, over the years, it has improved. And I do sincerely hope that this is a 2009 situation. And now we're in 2020, things should have improved to a large extent. Um, perhaps in our chit chats later on, you can share a bit more with me on this. But nonetheless, having said all these, um, there's another problem with respect to our pharma or biopharma industries that we have mostly batch processes. And the reason being is that many products under development essentially don't make it into market. And if you're trying to do a continuous process or other things, it may not be so viable right from the start. And um, of course, the other issue here is that oftentimes um, in a production plant, you try to make it such that uh, you have different processes coming in and that will make the batch process having more or greater flexibility over the continuous ones. And it's essentially for adapting to multiple products. It has uh, different unit ops. You can shift things around. The volumes of production again um, kind of fluctuates according to the market demand over the lifetime of the pharma products. Um, there's also batch to batch variations, especially in fermentation. Those of you who are in bowel processes will know. And to a large extent, it's easier to meet GMP requirements. So, um, so long as you tick all the boxes, you're okay. But if not, just throw the batch away, right? And of course, the other issue, if you go upstream, in terms of the R&D approaches, uh, traditionally it's very much based on batch chemistry. And when you try to kind of um, put in flow chemistry, that's, that's something that is rather new of late. Um, but I'll talk more about that later on. But again, there are many reasons and one of the reasons that are contributing to why we have more batch processes has to do with the fact that many of the R&D that's done like 10, 20 years ago, it's very much batch basis. And of course, the last thing here is difficulties in regulatory approvals. So all, all these kind of wrap things up and we have to a large extent batch process to handle in our industries. Another thing that, that is very critical here, as uh, all of you know, is this thing about sustainability. So since the year 2005, there is this ACS Green Chemistry Institute Pharmaceutical Roundtable. So what they try to do here is to get people from various um, places, maybe academia, maybe in the different pharma companies to, to talk about green chemistry and green engineering. So essentially that's, that's what they are doing over here, right? And um, this is from 2005. And another point that I'd like to highlight here is essentially when you look at green chemistry, there are three basic corollaries that people are talking about. The first thing here is that the designer of a chemical must take into consideration what will happen after the ages in widespread use in the marketplace. So that's, that's one thing that's being highlighted. The other one is that sustainability has to couple with economic advantage and that's ultimately the end goal. So this is also what in business terms people call the triple bottom line rather than just your financial bottom line. And of course, the other thing is that um, it's more kind of high moral um, argument here that industrialized nations are obliged to ensure that access to technological advancements or developments is preserved for emerging economies. So, so these are the kind of things that, um, even though it's not kind of related to science, 
but to a large extent, the, the whole thrust for sustainability and of course the climate change issue does change our perspective as to how we do farm scale manufacturing. So having said all of these, um, so what are the opportunities that's arising right now? So some of you may know that there, there is this ICHQ 13 document that is under, um, I would say, fermentation at this point in time. So basically in 2018, um, there is this uh, initiative that was proposed by the ICH and they're trying to write up a, a quality guideline like the other quality guidelines from Q1 all the way to Q12. So essentially here is a new quality guideline that they are looking at a perceived problem of a general consensus that continuous manufacturing has potential for improving the efficacy, the agility and flexibility of drug substance and drug product manufacturing, right? So um, some of you may have already got encountered with some of these things, but uh, this is quite a good push here because ultimately what people are looking at here is can we then use continuous manufacturing? So when you talk about continuous manufacturing, just think about the chocolate bars that are coming out from Cadbury manufacturing or say, for example, oil and gas industry, which is talking more about petrochemical products. Uh, can we do something like that? And um, to a large extent, this ICHQ13 is built upon the foundations of previous quality guidelines, as I mentioned. So a couple of headlines from the pharma continuous manufacturing. You start to see news like from Eli Lilly and company. In 2017, they obtained the FDA approval for breast cancer medication produced using continuous manufacturing. And Japan, Eli Lilly also became the first company in Japan to obtain the PMDA approval for a new pharmaceutical product. And Takasago Chemical is uh, currently partnering Eli Lilly to actively promote the transition from batch type reactors into continuous manufacturing. And Pfizer also has made certain headlines here. In 2018, they have obtained the FDA approval for acute myeloid leukemia treatment agent produced using, again, continuous manufacturing. And um, some of you may already know that they are very much in partnership with GA which is very much the uh, downstream secondary manufacturing to develop portable facilities for continuous manufacturing of solid dose preparations. And um, there's Shionogi also, farmer from Japan, who is also promoting introduction of continuous manufacturing for drug ingredients and pharmaceuticals. So the, these are the various headlines that you see of late in the couple of these recent years. And there's this uh, very nice uh, paper or a uh, report that is published by Mitsui and company. Uh, you can actually download it from the internet. So they talk about continuous manufacturing in pharmaceutical and fine chemical industries. So they kind of list out a couple of advantages that you can kind of expect by using continuous manufacturing. First of all, increase of efficiency. So ultimately, um, those of you who, who have um, encountered continuous manufacturing before, um, it's always at the start, at the end, that's, that's always the problem, right? Um, but in the middle, everything is more or less pseudo steady state, so everything is fine. So this is where you can then rip off the efficiency. And of course, it will maximize the automation across different unit ops. And from there, with efficiency, it will then enhance the product quality. And of course, if you have a continuous kind of automation that's going on 24-7, um, that's where also you have this uh, better gauge of what is safe, what is unsafe, and, and keep your control on. And because you're looking at a continuous manufacturing, imagine a situation where typically you need 100,000 liters to, to produce some kind of uh, fermentative product. Now you actually can just reduce it in size. Maybe you can just run on the 500 liter fermenter and do it continuously over time rather than having a, a big infrastructure kind of investment there. And because you have reduced the space and the footprint of manufacturing, therefore you indirectly or directly will reduce the environmental impact. But the challenges with respect to continuous manufacturing here would mean that a lot of the processes that are shared previously has to do with batch processes. And if you're looking at continuous manufacturing, you need to have a new type of catalyst or process to actually make your drugs, especially legacy ones. You may not actually have the cash to redo a second gen 
technology. So what are we going to do from there? And then second of all, um, because you need to continuously monitor the continuous process, that's where PAT becomes key in implementing that kind of continuous operations. And from there, of course, the development of um, sensor technologies, maybe hard sensors or soft sensors for continuous monitoring. But having said all these, actually there are very good initiatives and solutions that has been um, promoted over the past decade or so, right? And many of these are actually public-private R&Ds. So the very famous one in the EU is the FP factory. Some of you may know about that. In Australia, you've got the Flowworks. In Japan, you've got the Flow ST. In um, US, you've got the famous Novartis MIT collaboration. So, so these, these are various um, initiatives that, that people come together to, to try to uh, bring pharma from the traditional batch into continuous space. So just, just to give you a bit of a look and feel in terms of the EU F3 factory. So F3 stands for flexible, fast, and future. So the key technology concepts here essentially are process intensification and modularity approach. So they have um, a way of actually doing the uh, equipment assemblies. They call it process equipment assemblies and a way to actually put everything as you can see in, in this um, picture here into a container. So having a standard container, putting in all these process equipment assemblies, you then form a part of the continuous process, right? And you can actually ship this to anywhere in the world, so long as your supply chain can also bring in its, um, maybe the raw materials, if not uh, intermediate ingredients that's necessary. So this is a big project in the EU. So it involves about three, over 300 scientists, PhD students, and business and academic experts. And this, this is the kind of technology that actually was uh, introduced by Bayer. And some of these things that you see here are innovative kind of reactor designs that was not previously seen. And, and these are actually making part of this, like for example, this setup is very much similar to, to this kind of setup over here. All right. Okay, so moving on, um, again, just to highlight that um, by using continuous processes, you can potentially increase production. So this again is uh, quite an old publication in 2012, but basically Anderson was saying that you can use continuous process to increase your production and at the same time, um, you can make use of PAT that fits with the quality by design initiative that's promoted by the regulatory authorities. So what you see over here is, is a novel spinning tube in tube reactor. So most of us are kind of um, familiar with either the usual stirred tank or CSTR as some of you may know, or a typical plug flow reactor or PFR. But this is quite an innovative kind of way of designing the process whereby you have heat exchange, you have product coming in, product coming out, and you have a secondary feed pot also over here. So these, these are some of the things where if you look at um, PAT, we can then move into a continuous and uh, also try to match with the quality by design ideology that FDA promotes. So moving on to biotechnology, this is more like into my current field at this point in time. You then look at a typical fermentation. And from that fermentation, in this case, yes, you're looking at probably producing a monoclonal antibody. And you have certain CQAs or critical quality attributes that is related to this product. And what you then try to do is to put in different kinds of probes over here, uh, maybe pH, uh, dissolved oxygen, viable probes or whatsoever and try to use multivariate analysis, couple that with what's called CPPs or critical process parameters, and ultimately it leads into your design space and knowledge space. So this is where, as I was mentioning, if you would move around your, within your design space and any change in your operating conditions is not considered out of specs, right? So that's, that's very much traditionally when people are looking at things. Now, if you move on to something that's more upstream R&D, this is where you start to see the use of DOE, which is promoted to look into process understanding. And that leads to more academic endeavors in the omics space, which you are looking at metabolomics, fluxomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and genomics. 
So essentially what you can do here, which is what I'm trying to do at my workplace, is to do rapid sampling for fluxomics, metabolomics kind of work, and couple it with your PAT inline monitoring, maybe Raman, maybe NMR whatsoever, and do process modeling. And at the same time, work with colleagues who are in computational biology or informatics, and that's where you try to link what's going on within what I'll call the cell factory. So basically in our cells, you have your DNA. And from your DNA, it will then transcribe and give you RNA. And from your RNA, it will lead onto your proteins or enzymes. So that's where if you go from the fundamental, what's called the central dogma of biology, you will start from the genes going into your transcriptomics and finally to your proteomics. And from there, you then link it up with what's going on in your metabolism. And that leads to maybe an aerobic or anaerobic process if you're looking at fermentation, right? So all, all these are very exciting fields that, that is up and coming, or actually a lot of people are doing in the R&D space. But oftentimes, um, for various reasons, you, you don't see too much of that getting into the actual manufacturing. And of course, there's this review paper here that's talking about advances in downstream processing of biologics where you can use spectroscopy as an emerging PAT tools. Right. So if you look at the industry bioprocessing, of course, going back to this question of batch on continuous, you start to see that in the 1990s, a lot of the big pharma or even you talk about specialty chemicals, it has to do with large and huge sizes of fermenters. And then at the present time, more or less, you're looking at anything from 2,000 liters and below. Okay. And because of this kind of um, scale in terms of its production level, you will then have previously in terms of weeks turnover, now it's more like in days. Now the question here is that can you actually go down to much smaller scales? For example, you're looking at a cell therapy, um, or immunotherapy, can you actually produce the kind of um, immuno kind of um, training of the um, T cells and whatsoever that, that can help the patient to combat the cancer cells? Can that be much smaller scales? And, and that's kind of more personalized medicine, but, but nonetheless, the whole idea here is that can we move from something around this scale down to this kind of scale? And as a result of which we have more kind of hourly process in terms of getting the drugs out and out to where the patients need it, right? So you can imagine a two liter fermenter can just sit next to the uh, warts that, that the um, oncologists actually administer the immunotherapy, for example. That is one possibility, all right? So in summary, um, when you kind of put PAT and quality by design together with continuous manufacturing, there's a potential of a process evolution for both pharma and biopharma industries. And uh, to a large extent, when you look at continuous manufacturing in the pharma and biopharma, there are much promise from different angles, maybe from the science-oriented approach. You look at flow chemistries, there's a lot of work that's going done right now on flow chemistry. You look at process optimization and control, um, continuous operations, the PAs and the PECs I've mentioned to you from the F3 factory. Um, there's also the drive on sustainability, maybe green chemistry, uh, lowering our environmental footprint. Of course, there are economic benefits that, that comes along with that. There's lesser manufacturing space, so you don't need to ask a huge space from EDB to, to set up your new plant, right, in Singapore. Um, of course, it will have new supply chain opportunities, as I mentioned, if you are doing immunotherapy and hopefully that works in the next couple of years, then you actually can actually have your drugs being manufactured next to hospitals or just next to the wall, for example. And of course, with the uh, regulatory and quality assurance angle, you have the ICHQ-13 that is supposed to come out in the year 2021. Right, so people are thinking and writing up that guideline right now. And there are lots of headlines that's going on for public R&D and, and corporations, people like the uh, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, F3 Factory, etc. However, um, with all things, uh, there's challenges. So as I mentioned, um, you need to convert the current back processes into continuous ones. So that would mean it requires 
some investment in terms of the scientific and technological changes, maybe new catalysts, new ways of doing fermentation. So you may not do a batch or fat batch, you may look at perfusion kind of fermentative process. And with that kind of process, how does that change your downstream processing? That's another question. And of course, that would require the necessity of real-time process monitoring and control, and that's where PAT, quality by design, digitalization comes in. And of course, the large uncertainty now everybody's talking about it is what's going to happen in the post-COVID-19 world, right? So there's economic challenges. Um, not all our pockets are that deep, like what the US government can do in terms of its uh, stimulus packages, right? And uh, supply chain disruptions right now is going on. And with all these, uh, there's, of course, impedances to R&D efforts. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be very happy to... Um, have a chit chat with you guys. Uh, thank you very much. That was, um, that was terrific. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions? We might as well have the Q&A session now. Is there anyone with any questions? Um, from myself, Chewy, uh, just when you speak about, you know, the, the, the size getting smaller, um, mm -hmm. Uh, in the continuous uh, manufacturing and also coupling that with the post-COVID world uh, yep. where there's a disruption of supply chain and all that kind of stuff. Do mm -hmm. you think there'll be kind of more of a move for, you know, countries to be able to supply their own pharmaceuticals instead of there being these big pharmaceutical hubs, you know, like Singapore would be, like Ireland would be, that there'll be more of a push for, you know, each country able to kind of supply their own um, pharmaceuticals? And perhaps that the continuous manufacturing might lend itself to that, might make that more possible. I, I think there are a couple of things here that, that is complicating things. So, of course, on the one hand, it's more geo, geopolitics, which is out of our reach, right? So, uh, the other thing would be, as I mentioned, if you look at the um, final slide that I have here, let me just flash this again, or I should just zoom this in. I think it's easier that way. So you actually require quite a fair bit of scientific and technology changes. And, and that would mean that some of the catalysts, some of the fermentative modes that was traditionally used cannot be used in, in this new situation. So what I do kind of see is the fact that definitely there's, there's all kinds of um, gearing towards trying to manufacture things from your own locality, maybe a huge nation like the US, or even the, the small nation like Singapore. So what Singapore is doing in respect to COVID is that uh, we are investing in um, resources to be at least one of the major players in producing the vaccine. So that, that's one thing that Singapore government is putting in. Um, again, I, I, I don't have um, answers partly because I only see things from a scientific point of view. <laughs> does, does that answer you? It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Anyone with any questions at the moment? Another one from me. You just mentioned a little bit about, you know, there's a necessity for a lot of research and development, new catalysts, all that kind of stuff. Would you mm -hmm. The regulatory uh, agencies like the FDA being a major obstacle, I suppose, for this for this continuous manufacturing to become more mainstream. Do you think it's the regulatories who are being too conservative or whatever it is, not quite knowing how to uh, ensure the safety of maybe this new technology or new catalysts or new um, processes that that will be a major stumbling block to, to getting this continuous manufacturing kind of more mainstream? Right. Um, I, I was in the uh, conference at MIT in 2015, if I'm right. So quite a large group of technical directors from different companies, maybe small molecules or biologics companies were there. And Janet Woodcock was the director from CEDAR FDA who was addressing us. And, and what you've just asked is one of the questions that, that was posed to her. And quite um, candidly, she actually said that 
her guys in, in uh, FDA aren't kind of up to speed in terms of the technology that's going on. Because uh, you may have realized that as I was sharing about the, the PAT initiative, it was started by FDA in 2004. But over the past 15 to 16 years, um, as much as they try to catch up with the technology and the science, um, they are not only conservative, but I must say there's also a, a lack of understanding of the variety of different things that's going on. So for example, when you try to apply PAT in a blending process, it is quite different from applying PAT on the crystallization process. And then on top of that, you put another uh, guy looking into uh, fermentative processes, right? So uh, until and unless you, you've got a, a strong pool of workforce within FDA who is able to understand all these um, existing process, and then now we're talking about immunotherapies and whatever else is coming up, it's, it's gonna complicate the situation for them. So there's, there's no uh, straightforward answer from the regulatory perspective. Right, so, so bottom line is FDA are not up to speed. You, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you. Very uh, sorry, Jayan, this is uh, Prasad, uh, not Chibi. Thank you for your presentation. I would say it's not just the FDA, even the quality functions within the industry are not ready. Okay. And, uh, I've done multiple roles in tech services. I think I did the world's first continuous uh, reactor filing with FDA. I think, mm -hmm. what was that, to 2008, you know? Yeah, it's the world's first blood flow reactor for API manufacturing filing, you know, out of Singapore, designed in Singapore and built. My, my view is that the existing quality systems are unable to cope with the humongous amount of data that's generated out of uh, PAT. We also mm -hmm. see a huge amount of information, you know, what we call as metadata, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, and you know, it's like, you know, if I show you three bits of data, you can make a decision. If I show you three million bits of data, what would you do with it, you know? Yeah. So for example, uh, you take, let's take oral solid dosage forms. You take 20 tablets, you know, you crush them, you do two assays, fine. Let's say we have a NIR uh, sensor on every tablet. That's 4 million tablets a batch. I give 4 million data points. Quite a few of them are outside the specifications because the specifications are developed not for continuous process. So in reality, the spec should be more statistically defined, you know, like a sigma level, something like that. Yeah. I think that's a big challenge, I believe. People don't know uh, how to judge quality. Uh, we, we in Pfizer use quite a lot of continuous process. Even in Singapore, you know, we've, we've got uh, near infrared, we've got uh, focus beam reflectance microscopy. We mm -hmm. used to have uh, online GC, a lot of stuff, uh, and um, optical rotation online. Mm -hmm. But uh, each application is up to, up, up to half a million dollars, mainly mm -hmm. because of the cost of cabling, you know, and the intrinsic safety environment. But the payback is only in terms of process understanding. We don't have much, uh, much uh, relief, regulatory relief, you know, because you, you still do all your in-process testing offline. You still do your, you know, KQAs, you know, uh, mm -hmm. testing. So, so, you know, that's a disappointment. After 10 years, I think the whole quality uh, uh, the quality influences within the industry and outside in terms of regulators have been come to grips, you know. Uh, I, I don't know how the food industry does and petrochemicals, they, they, but in our industry, it's still a disappointment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you mentioned about petrochemicals and food. Of course, in petrochemicals, to a large extent, um, because it's not ingested by people, uh, to a large extent, so long as you meet some kind of what's called COA, your your certificate of assurance. Um, yeah, yeah. People yeah, generally well, it, right. Well, but, I audited Shell Petroleum. I was surprised they didn't even have a quality guy to meet. You know, <laughs> some <laughs> engineer guy, and they had one uh, holding tank and they had three reject tanks, and we would not do that in pharma. You know, <laughs> but, right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. But, yeah. Partly because I, I guess to a large extent, again, the difference in volumes in, in pharma, every batch is 
huge money. But in um, oil and gas, a container is no big deal, <laughs> right? So uh, that's, that's one of the issues. And, and if you go to food, food to a large extent, I must say they, they are doing far better than um, farmer in terms of regulation. I'm not entirely sure how they manage to do it. But um, if you look at the, I was using the case of Cadbury chocolates, right? Generally speaking, the, the chocolate bars that we're buying from supermarkets, they're generally all right. And, and I guess to a large extent, it has to do with the fact that um, for food, oftentimes we, we are eating it um, and you don't necessarily see huge impact to your health. So like, for example, it's been um, decades, I guess, that everybody's saying that we should not be eating too much of processed food, right? Or, or drinking too much soda, that kind of thing. But yet you see them coming out with, with very innovative products that, that is able to make money and at the same time not kill people in, in a short while. But if you contrast that with um, drugs, that's, that's where the difference comes in. Because if today I have a really bad headache and I need a Panadol to help me, and when I go into, let's say, Guardian Pharmacy or somewhere there to, to get the, the fast relief Panadol, I would expect within two hours my headache is um, suppressed. If not, it might be that I, I got very, very bad migraine or worse still, right? Things, things like this automatically, it has a very sensitive um, impact onto the um, whole business of pharma. So as a result of which, um, it's kind of easier to actually produce products in, in the food side of things and still get away with um, certain things that is not exactly of, on par, perhaps. But on the other hand, if you have, I was giving you the case of drug recalls, situations where bad batches comes out, or worse still, I, I take a product and it doesn't work. That, that's going to cause a lot of backlash from the pharmaceutical angle. Yeah, the, but the majority of recalls are due to labeling errors. So, uh, you know, yes, that's whatever that's you it. say, the pharma still has a very high sigma level. Of course, you waste a lot of money achieving that level, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that leaves the door is of a high quality, I believe, compared to many other industries. Yes, we yes. don't achieve it efficiently. That's another story. Yes, yes. So, so, so to a large extent, I, I must say we are kind of victims of our own success. Because as, as I kind of use the analogy of food, right? Um, there, there are situations out there, if we say, uh, you, you know a little bit on cocoa fermentation, actually a lot of the cocoa batches that comes out from, from the world's producers aren't that good. But somehow they are still able to mix it in, to a certain extent where we actually have pretty good chocolate coming up from some of the factories. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that um, even though they have not achieved our Six Sigma or even better, they somehow are able to get away with murder, so to speak. <laughs> be yeah, they do. They do. They blend batches into compliance. It's practice right. and petrochemical as well. Yeah. Right. And, okay. and that has to do with the fact that to a large extent, our, our taste buds or, or in terms of uh, sensory profiles here, because I'm very much into food work now, our, our taste buds, our olfactory uh, receptors are, are not so sensitive compared to whether or not this particular drug, for example, Panadol, is efficacious. Because when you talk about efficacy and toxicology and things like that, it has to do with the patient's health. But when yeah. you talk about whether I'm willing to spend uh, a dollar less buying this, this uh bad chocolate, yeah, probably, why not? <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Um, just to open the floor up a bit, does anyone else have any questions for Chewy? Any other final comments or thoughts? Hello, Chewy. Hello, hi. Marisa here. So hi. you mentioned we're working more on the biopharma side now as well. So uh, not really. It's more, more on the food part. So if, if you guys are interested, I, I can actually go through some of the things that I am doing right now. Yeah, sure. 
Okay, so so let let me just uh, quickly pro probably I start from this slide. It might be easier this way. Let, let me just start from this slide. Okay, so um, as you guys probably know, I, I very much start from a PAT kind of uh, R and D at A star quite a number of years ago. So as I move on to CIFB, which is the new National Food Institute, um, I'm looking at several things here. And of course, the first thing I'm looking at is uh, chemical analysis and methods development. So to a large extent, I'm looking at chromatography methods, uh, mass spectrometry, maybe using single quad or even TOF, time of flight, analytical method validation and metabolomics, I'll share a bit more later on. And on the other hand, um, there's also targeted versus untargeted analysis here. So untargeted, we are looking at aroma profiling, uh, food ingredients, we're also looking at uh, multivariate chemometrics applying to um, food. And to a large extent, that's kind of going back to the whole principle of quality by design. If you know your food, you should be able to characterize it well. But having said that, in any chocolates, you've got at least 600 different compounds. So how, how do you map out a good quality chocolate? That is the challenge. Um, the other thing I'm doing here is multi-physics bioprocess modeling. So we are looking at uh, cell growth and related kinetics, transport phenomenon, hydrodynamics and whatsoever, and um, using fermentative approaches, maybe scale up or downscaling. I'll share a bit more later on. Um, and then there's this intelligent bioprocess process development that's going on. I set up the 250 liters pilot scale bioreactor at CIFB and putting in different kind of inline analytics, uh, multivariate data analysis, uh, computer modeling for process understanding and advanced process control. So very, very quickly, without boring you guys, Aroma profiling has to do with um, how you look at a compound, maybe from GCMS, and then link that with what is called the uh, organoleptics. We have what is called a GCO pot where you can put your nose here to smell the separated out compounds. And then from there, you develop a fragrance library, and we have an in-house database. In this case, we are applying it to essential oils. And from there, you have what's called sensory panels to, to then lead to asking yourself the question, is this a bit earthy smell? Is this a bit sweet? Is, is this more like a synthetic smell? So having said all these, you can then start to classify different kinds of compounds in terms of its fragrance notes, right? And you can do the same thing with uh, flavors, except that it's more your tongue in this case. And um, we actually work with a local company. Uh, you have uh, used their app before. So behind the app, there is this fingerprint technology that we use uh, machine learning to predict the taste of the tea. So different kinds of tea, maybe black, green, or oolong, um, tao hong pao, red tea whatsoever. They have different kinds of bitterness, different kinds of sweetness, even umami or astringency. So you can actually go up to the website and then put in your kind of preferences and based on a multivariate analysis, they are then able to kind of map the um, profile that you like and suggest to you the kind of teas that you can buy from them online. The other thing that we do here is a, a spectroscopic um, scanner. I, I can't say for uh, uh, confidential issues what exactly it is, but essentially this can then tell you the quality of a tea. If you put in the um, kind of dried tea leaves or um, blended tea in, into this uh, spectrometry machine, all right? Um, the other thing is very much to do with process development, going up to scale up and then process control and improvement. Uh, just to highlight again metabolomics. So in this case, we are using rapid sampling techniques. So the whole idea here is to look into a um, secondary met metabolic pathway that leads to the production of lycopene. Lycopene, some of you may know, it is a carotenoid that is found in tomatoes. And uh, that, that red color that you see there is either lycopene, if not beta carotene. So a lot of these are actually very high value products. High value meaning that it can cost a couple of hundred dollars per kilogram of it. So a lot of lycopene right now is actually found in tomatoes, but what if we can coax an E. coli, that is a bacteria to produce this stuff, right? So in what I'm doing right now is to look at from the fermentation process, do what's called rapid sampling and quenching and identify the metabolites. In this case, what's called MVA pathway all the way from MVA 
all the way down to FPP and GPP. So all, all these is all uh, metabolites that has to do with the production of lycopene and beta carotenes and the rest. And from there lead to computational biology modeling. And with that, you start to understand, oh, because of certain things that you put into your fermenter, therefore this pathway is being shut down. Then how do I put in other things or change the operating parameters? So this is where the metabolic engineering comes in. You optimize the strain. Once you optimize the cells, the strain, then you put into the fermenter again to work things out. So that's, that's part of what I'm doing. The other thing is actually to then put on inline or online analytics. In this case, we have a multiplexing Raman spectrometer. And on the other case, we have an online mass spec that is linked to a 16-port multi-stream to a parallel variator system. So this is where we can do anything from a high throughput screening all the way to, in this case, the lycopene producing E. coli. Right. And, and this is how the Raman looks like. It's, it's pretty yucky in terms of baseline, and I have to do some uh, multivariate analysis to solve the problem here. So moving on, what we're trying to do is to then put on other things like, for example, dielectric spectroscopy. So some of you may know that in this case, you have a probe like this, where it sets up what's called an electromagnetic field. And depending on your cells that you have put into the broth, over time, what's going on is like a, a typical uh, population in the country where viable cells will have intact membrane like this. So when there's an electric field that's encountered, you will have separation of um, polarities. So the positive and the negative charges will be set up like this. However, if you have cells that are dead or half dead, this is where it's called non-viable cells you will then have all these um, chemicals leaking out of the cell membrane. So when it comes through the EMF field, it doesn't have much consequences. So what this probe does is to detect the disturbance to the electromagnetic field. And from there, you can correlate something like this, whereby typically in a uh, fermenter, you try to follow what's called the dry cell weight or DCW. However, if you actually follow through the capacitance reading, which is related to dielectric spectroscopy, you actually start to see that even before you think you have hit the maximum of cells, the viability of a cell has already started to decrease. And at this point, you might think that you actually hit the maximum. Actually, the viability has dropped by what, 20%, if not more. So, so this is where by having more information in, um, let's say, mammalian cell culture, for, for the case of biopharma, it can be actually useful. Sorry, uh, can, can you repeat your question? Hello. I, I think he was accidentally off mute. Uh, oh, okay. All right. All right. Question. Okay. Right, sure. Continue. Continue. Then, continue. Okay. Let me just quickly continue. So this 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 one thing that I'm implementing in my lab currently. The other thing I'm I'm getting out a tender to buy is a low field NMR spectrometer. So basically, again going back to a stirred tank here, you have fermentation going on. We can actually pump out these um, broth and degassing it in the first place and then get the liquid phase coming through here. So we can either work on a continuous flow through, if not a stop flow mechanism where you can actually stop the flow then measure the NMR. So what you can do here essentially is to, in this case, a publication in um, Journal of Biotechnology and Bioengineering last year, you can actually measure the uh, ethanolic fermentation that's going on. So when you correlate the uh, NMR with the um, changes that's either monitored by the Raman or offline HPLC, you can see good corroboration of the data. And um, some of us who are very much in fermentation use also will pick up things like glycerol, glucose and fructose levels, because all these will influence the um, what's called the carbon source and, and how it changes the metabolic flux. So out of this paper, they did say that um, Raman, even though it allows faster spectroscopic acquisition and higher quantitative precision, 
However, NMR is the one that's better resolved because when you look at the peaks in the NMR, it's, it's not overlap as much as the Raman. So in terms of my work, this is the uh, pilot plan I've, I was mentioning to you about that I'm setting up or I just set up. And uh, this is the inline probe for the Raman. And you can actually stick one of them into the 250 liters on the side like this. And at the same time, you have another probe here which is um, for the production of a seed culture that will in turn be pumped into the 250 liters to do a scale up. And again, I've applied this to the lycopene producing E. coli culture. So the other thing that's going on is very much uh, switching of gears here. We're looking at multi-physics simulations here. So we're coupling multi-phase fluid dynamics, maybe gas, liquid, or solid with mass transfers and cell growth kinetics. And essentially the whole idea here is to see how we can simulate and understand the production rate, not so much from what I've shared with you earlier. In, in this case, I'm actually producing it in the pilot scale plant. However, in this case, what I'm doing here is to do simulations like this. So basically this, this is a in silico study. And what I'm trying to do here is essentially to study the different bioreactor configurations, maybe different baffles, impellers, or tank geometries, and how does that impact the um, mixing characteristic and cell growth. And what you can do quite interestingly now, of course, you, you need to have the right software package to actually do this. You can trace what's called the cell population lifelines, right? So uh, we've heard a lot about different kinds of simulations for, for COVID nowadays, but it's almost the same situation here we are looking at as the cells traverse through the different parts of this um, bioreactor, how does it change in terms of its um, lifeline? And it may has to do with the fact that typically when you look at the bioreactor configuration, you have a lot of dosing of say your carbon source at the top, but all your aeration is coming at the bottom. So you can imagine if you are somewhere here as a cell, you have a lot of oxygen to breathe in, but you are starving for food and vice versa. If you're up here, you've got tons of food, but you cannot breathe because you lack of oxygen. And then all these cause all kinds of stress to each of the cells within the population. And how do we simulate this? And that's what I'm trying to do. So there's something called a digital twin multi-physics models that we are trying to do here. So ultimately is to couple multi-physics modeling with different bioreactor bio design. You can start with 20,000 liters, which is quite typical in a large scale specialty chemical kind of production. Try to then mimic this within a 250 liters that I have, or some of the smaller ones like one or two or five liters. The other trick that you can do essentially is what's called downscaling, right? So downscaling essentially is to mimic this entire 20,000 liter setup in a five liter stirred tank linked to a plug flow reactor. So the details I, I can't share too much because it's quite technical, but just uh, think about it as a kind of digital twin that you can use to simulate the um, environment that the cells are seeing as it goes through this. And then at the same time, because we are now looking at smaller scales here, I can then also go back to the lab and try to mimic it or simulate it in real life. And if the in silico and the actual work in the lab corroborates, that's, that's where we can then say that, okay, this is a good strain. We can potentially put that strain in the 20,000 liter. If let's say in the real world, it doesn't work in the small scales, then this is where we go back to the drawing board and, and relook at the metabolic pathways and try to re-engineer or optimize the strain. Right, so um, basically that's it. Um, trying to implement uh, different kinds of PAT monitoring from half a liter to 250 liter scales, maybe Raman, online mass spec or online NMR. Um, it can be also dynamic metabolomics for understanding the microbial cell populations in terms of its hydrogenity in the fermentation. Um, that will involve quenching rapid sampling techniques, LCMS quantification. And to build a, a validated database of compounds. Um, I was talking about hormone profiling, T profiles and whatsoever, and that kind of leads back to quality by design, where if you know a food ingredient and a product quality, how then that leads to safety, nutrition and authentication. And to develop a um, digital twin, multi-physics simulation of bioprocess equipment, in this case, bioreactors. 
and also looking at a uh, multivariate kinematics and machine learning and, and how does this uh, let us know a bit more of the process understanding as we kind of data mine into the um, analytical data that we have. And last but not least, um, we are trying to look for some kind of food grade application that we can do at uh, CIFB. So we're trying to do a situation where um, the food nutritionist can tell us there are certain things that can be good for us to let's say develop for diabetic patients, for example. And then from there can be engineer certain strains of uh, microbes to actually produce that kind of food and then try to make something that is food grade and then we can actually um, test it out in our labs. Yep, so that's, that's the kind of work that I'm involved right now. Uh, thank you. For that. Uh, the, the lady who had uh, a, a question, uh, did, did, you, did you, was this answered here? Did you have a, a question or do you want to say it now? No, no, I was just asking uh, Chewy to share more as well about his, about what he has seen so far because, um, I mean, in Singapore, there hasn't been that much movement in terms of um, PAT that is um, more widely known. So this definitely does show um, us what is actually going on, especially on the research point. Um, another thing I would like to ask is, what are some of the common issues that you see, especially in the bio side? Because, um, for example, if let's say we are doing NIR normally in in um in uh API chemical API monitoring, then you may see like probe blinding, etc. And if you monitor DO, certain certain cell cultures may also blind the DO probe. Mm -hmm. so, in terms of so far, we are looking, we have mentioned about Raman, etc. Are there any issues with them, or is there any uh, consideration why we wouldn't use other forms of technology at the moment? Right. So um, you have rightly highlighted the fact that whatever analytical technology that we use, we are looking only at the part in the entire vessel or the entire process. So to a large extent, when you try to uh, monitor that particular part, then the first question we need to ask is whether that part is representative. So if I will kind of go back to some of my other slides here. So if let's say you put your probe over here, and this is not representative of the kind of cells that you're trying to look at, then it may not necessarily be telling you the uh, kind of cell population lifelines that you're looking at. That, that's number one. Then second of all, there's no way you get all the data that is required to monitor every single process. So as with all things, there's also the part where you need to bring in multivariate data analysis to actually help you to have a kind of soft sensor to, to sense at which direction is your uh, culture going forward. So that's very much going back to say, for example, I was mentioning about the um, yeah, dielectric probes. So new sensors like this can tell you a bit more. I, I hope that kind of answers your question. It's, it's not a one size fit all kind of situation. Yeah. And, and that's probably part of the reason why, especially in the Singapore context, you, you don't see that many implementation of PAT in the manufacturing aspects. Yeah, thanks, Chewy. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Any other any, yes, okay, excellent to hear your, uh, yeah, any more questions? If there are no more questions or final thoughts, last chance, anyone? Uh, well, I think we can probably leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Chewy. Uh, certainly got a lot from that talk and I'm sure everyone else I got an awful lot from it too. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm not 100% sure what our next Technical Tuesday talk is, but it'll be on uh, same time again next month, last Tuesday of the month. So I hope to see you all there. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much, Chewy. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good evening.